Oh, very nice. Okay, let me call the uh, meeting. Uh, Kittitas County Public Hospital, District Number One, uh, regular board meeting to order. Um, before we do the approval of agenda, let's uh, do a quick roll call to see who's here. Uh, Justin, go ahead. Matt Altman here. Bob Davis. John Ward here. Erica Libano here. Terry Clark here. Julie Peterson here. Scott Olander here. Dr. Kevin Martin here. Dr. Roberta Hobby. Amanda Scott here. Michelle Whirl here. Mandy Olson here. Vicki Machoro here. Dee Dee Utley. Rhonda Holden here. Stacey Olea here. Jeff Yamada here. Ron Erlacher. Here. Trisha Sinek. She said she was here remotely in the chat. Perfect. Uh, and then we also have uh, Nasser. Here. Chase and Adler will also be joining later on. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, as we uh, look at the agenda, there's just uh, one uh, small change under education board report. Justin's going to talk to us about a couple of education opportunities. So please make note of that. Uh, with that change to the agenda, is, are there any other changes to the agenda? Or uh, if not, uh, motion to approve the agenda. Okay. Motion by Erica, second by John. Uh, if there's no further discussion, please. Uh, if you approve the amended agenda, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you. I uh, hope you guys have had a chance to review the consent agenda. It includes the minutes from our December meeting, which is January 5th, uh, Friday before Finance Committee. Are there any uh, questions or any changes to make to the uh, consent agenda? I would uh, move to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Motion by. John. Second. Second by Terry. Uh, if there's no further discussion, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Yes. Uh, next up, it's time for public comments and announcements. Uh, remember, if you have any comments to make, please keep it to three minutes and start by introducing yourself and giving your address. Uh, do we have anyone who would like to make a public comment or announcement? All right, hearing from no one, we will proceed then. Uh, today we have a presentation from Amanda Scott. Uh, Amanda, it's all yours. So can I just key this up? Um, I, I was down in the human resources office waiting for to go into the principal's office here. And um, I looked up and this is our huddle board and all the stuff they're trying, I mean, we could not have volunteers in this hospital for more than two years. So to look up and see about them onboarding volunteers and students was really exciting. And the fact that our open positions was down below 100, and just it just occurred to me there are so many exciting things going on in human resources that have handled such titanic changes in the last six months, the benefits and, and compensation changes. And I got excited about it, so I thought, minute presentation from Amanda would be helpful. So kudos to our HR department. They do extraordinary work. So. Thank you for that. Are you, um, can you all hear okay if I stay here? I'd be happy to move to the front if I don't block the camera. That's okay. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, this is our metrics board and we do daily huddles um, every day. Um, and so in addition to monthly metrics that we provide all of you in our reports, and um, we've been talking a lot about workforce as well and the things that we're tracking. These are the things that on a daily basis we're really looking at for our employees, for our staffing, keeping our hospital, um, you know, and clinics and the rest of our organization staff. And um, uh, so I want to go over a few things here um, of some of the regular things that we talk about. As Julie mentioned, student volunteers, um, a lot of people are really shocked when they see that 97 learners in process. So we have quite a bit of partnerships and affiliations. We work with Dr. Martin for the medical students. So Kyle and Dr. Martin work really well together. 
Um, but we have, you know, nursing students, pharmacy students, EMT students, so that we coordinate to medical students. And so there's quite a lot of the same onboarding, tracking, interviewing, yeah. um, paperwork that we do for um, multiple aspects of our workforce beyond our employees. Volunteers, it's been, as you mentioned, it's very exciting. We've had some new volunteer positions. Um, we've had volunteers in the emergency department this year, which was new. That so was a new position. We've had volunteers in the math. Be able to help direct patients to provide like volunteer nurse Those are medical people, you're true volunteers, yeah. just available yeah. for whatever's needed. Yeah, not, not necessarily licensed, but um, just being a nurse instead of eyes and ears, and um, when you know the patient, for example, maybe needs um, an additional support person, that person necessarily isn't the one intervening if there's a concern, but notifying the staff and being extra eyes to be able to do support. Um, so we haven't had to get shocked, as you know, but um, we did do some gift shop sales randomly around the organizations for our staff. Like we went up to Radio Hill during the holidays, we went up to Cleo, and the staff just loved that. There it was an opportunity for us to have some areas that we haven't normally been, and so we got to re-engage our gift shop volunteers, and they were thrilled to be able to be involved in that as well. And so, and then we have five in um, pre-volunteer stage as well, kind of on onboarding. So Kyle has been very creative in how we use volunteers this year, which is great. Um, Recruitment, um, there, I just, again, kudos to the leaders and directors that really um, looked at our next budget. We had we spent a lot of time evaluating our recruitment needs as we developed our next budget for the year. We were in the 90s, 80s for quite some time. And um, really by going through this um, process and, and looking at what are our realistic needs for the year, not necessarily our hopes and dreams, but like what are we realistically going to be able to recruit? We were, we were really able to um, get that number down by there's a sunshine around 52 because um, that allowed us to reprioritize our high needs uh, recruitment positions. For example, if you skip down to that and you see where it says WSNA, MA, PCT, and imaging, those are what are considered our top jobs. So those ones are eligible for referral bonus for employees. They can uh, refer their friends, family members, and get bonus for that to help with recruitment. Um, we had about 23 MAs on there for most of the year, and now we're down to five MAs. So kudos to Stacy and her team. They've been working on the MA Apprentice Program. And when we really looked at how many apprentices we're going to have graduating, and they're already in a paid position in FTE, we realized we don't actually need 23 postings right now because we're, we're going to try to place those apprentices. And if we do assess that and have needs later on, we'll, we'll submit those and evaluate those as well. So a lot of work evaluating accurate, realistic FTE counts for the year. Um, Pre-employment, I just got to say, we have orientations almost every day. We've been very flexible in HR to start people as soon as they can get going so that they're not delaying the managers. Um, it's, of course, added a lot for not just HR, but clinical education, IT, workplace health. They're all partners for us. It's a whole process of how we, um, in that pre-employment stage, get people onboarded. And so right now, for example, we have 15 people in that pending orientation, and I think we have a group of seven um, in orientation coming up. And um, they are either waiting for orientation, waiting for their, their drug screen results, waiting for the workplace health or their background check, but they've all been offered a position and will be starting with KPH. Um, number of hires year to date, that's usually much higher, but we're only in January right now and we're at 13. So if you can think about the fact that we're in the, um, I think we submitted this uh, earlier in the week, um, we're almost hiring a person today lately of yeah. uh, what we're doing. So it's been very busy. Um, so that's recruitment has kind of been uh, in pre-employment is definitely something we look at every day. Um, unfortunately, Marissa, our recruiter, had to relocate to South Dakota, and she was anxiously waiting to get under 75 postings. So um, we got to say goodbye to her and then to say we're finally down to 53 postings. Um, from a benefits and leave perspective, um, that's something that we don't usually put in this type of metrics, but it's important for you all to know because um, it's it impacts our staffing. You know, we've had a lot of leave law changes in Washington State, especially, but also in the works at the federal level. And so employees do have expanded access in addition to those generous leave banks that we provide our PTO benefit um, to additional leave, paid family medical leave, for example, um, and Washington State sick leave. And so the leaves, we have 93 people that have approved leaves. That's not necessarily everybody in one day that's out on leave, but that's about double than what we saw two years ago, before COVID and before the paid family medical went into effect. 
and we don't expect that to slow down. That really impacts our staffing, and um, you know, it's it's all for approved reasons, but it's something we need to be able to anticipate. So Ginger manages that process, and then our accommodations process, which most of those are still for COVID, um, COVID, and um, and then we have you know for other reasons, if it's a workplace injury or surgery or um, somebody needs light duty, we track that as well because sometimes. There's other duties they can perform and to try to help match them up with other places in the organization to keep them working. Um, if they're available to work and just can't go back to their normal, normal workplace. Um, and then evaluations, of course, you do see that on your metrics that we provide. And then we do have a reporting section as well that we have our monthly board reports. And uh, we actually have our financial report up there so we can keep our eye on that as well. Um, that's up there now after I took this picture. Um, and so we look at a lot of moving parts every day for employees and every day, you know, this is already out of date, I must say, because when I take a picture yesterday, we already hired more people, made more offers, um, more people on leave. So just a lot of moving parts. You know, what a camp, aim for that A live stream of our orientation. Um, but this is just our metrics board. What we do in our huddle is we actually, whoever's facilitating our huddle every day gets to pick a board. Um, we end up looking at our metrics board every day because that's usually what we need to talk about. Um, but we also have a projects board that we, and we have an audits and compliance board for things like end of the year file review. Um, we're right now looking at kind of our I-9 process and how we're storing our I-9s. Um, and then our projects board, which is a lot of the things that you guys get updated on in your board reports on a monthly basis, things like sex training, um, our staff development work. Um, this year, we're also going to be doing total compensation statements for all of our staff so that they can see the value of their benefits package and their compensation together. Those type of things that we have projects on as well. And then we have a calendar and stuff on board of kind of what's ahead, what's next, and um, what's coming in HR. So that's uh, a portion of what we what we have. How many uh, how many people work in HR? So we have um, Kyle is in HR, but he, his role is his assistant and volunteer services, so he's not necessarily for HR. Um, and then Marlo and Ashley, um, Marlo is uh, is kind of our HR specialist. She doesn't work in the HR office, but she processes everything behind the scenes, as you know, with benefits. And um, Ashley is our staff development specialist, so she's not in the office either. Um, so we have, um, let's see, three, four, five, four HR people um, in the office, and then three outside the office, and then Lionel Garcia is actually part HR IT and part IT. He does all of our HRAS, um, biz library support, technical support, and things like that. Um, so I think my report, um, my labor report is 7.5 FTEs with that, um, but not all of it is core HR. Some of it is staff development, student volunteers in HRAS. Are there any other uh, questions or uh, Gasps of amazement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very impressive. Yeah. And I just want, speaking of leaves, our plan is that Mayna will be here at the February meeting, but yeah. <laughs> now everything always goes to plan. So, yeah, you have to talk to Nan to catch her in the next one. Getting close to February is a short month. So. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And Matt, before you move on, I'm going to have to make a correction to my consent motion. Yeah. Can people check their report? Do they have three Ds and minutes from the finance committee? My, my report ends up not having that. So. Well, I think it was separate. To, uh, I, I think. That's uh, coming itself separately. Yes. But, but that's finance for today, right? Not the. And again, this is why it'd be helpful if it said finance committee and what date the minutes we're looking for. This is too vague on three D. Well, this was uh, so uh, January. See, I thought that was your report for today. Is that considered the? Well, then this is this finance report is for the the um, meeting you had on Tuesday, which included the minutes from the previous meeting. Are those the minutes that go here? These were the minutes from the previous meeting. Not, not, not for the, uh, the. So I guess my concern is it's just not going in the document according to to this then, and, and so. Uh, but again, in the future, it'd be nice to say finance money and what minutes we're looking for. That would end this conversation immediately. Okay. Because I'm just I'm going from the foundation into Mandy's report 
with nothing here that connects to 3D on the on the agenda. So I just want to make sure it's accurate in my motion. Yeah, I stuck the uh, I put it in. Oh, uh, do you have your problem solved? Do you have yours uh, over there? I, I put mine in here where Scott was going to talk about. Yeah, so that's uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was no uh, affiliated page number, so I think that was the idea. Okay, sorry to interrupt. No, that's all right. It's good to get these things uh, clear. Uh, okay, so uh, if there's nothing else, then we'll move on to uh, Mandy's. Uh, Mandy, support for quality, chief quality officer. Mandy, cool. Um, I'm sorry, my report is a little bit small this time, but uh, I think part of it was the short back to back meetings. Um, also, we've been really exciting, excited getting ready for for our coffee work this year. So a lot of planning has been happening even in the last few days. Um, so I'll just give you a few updates really quickly, um, kind of related to coffee plans and what's coming. Uh, there's about eight of us that are be attending a DNB education next month before the next board meeting uh, in Morton, Washington. It's, uh, several rural hospitals are getting together to do ISO 9001 internal audit training. So that's really exciting that we're going to be getting that training. And from that, we should be giving more training then to our leaders and staff and, and you about what that means, what ISO 9001 and why they care about it. Um, so that should be coming in the future. We're really excited. Uh, and then we owe you and the staff an employee engagement survey this year. I don't know if you recall in the past, we decided to alternate between more traditional HR employee engagement survey and the hospital or the, the survey of patient safety culture, which is a HRQ kind of standard of patient safety culture. So we'll be doing that survey this year. We're starting to prepare for, there's different versions of the survey. Um, what populations will we use that survey with and hope to have that rolling out May or June this year. Um, and that really ties in with um, not only employee engagement, but the coffee we have about the patient safety culture. Um, I wanted to let you know too that part of that um, being the employer of choice, patient safety culture, uh, just development of our staff, we've been looking at uh, our process improvement curriculum, support, training we can provide. And this week, Ann kicked off two cohorts of folks going through um, a seven part training for improvement for our leaders. So the quality team is, is one group um, and I think we're including our trauma and stroke uh, coordinator Cody Saab in the group with us and Ashley Min Minner, the um, staff development coordinator. And then the second group is a group of leaders that were hired last year. It's kind of a cohort of those new leaders. And so this is more in depth process improvement training for them. Um, that first session yesterday, they said it went great. They got a lot of great feedback, um, that it was fun, uh, that they were learning a lot. And I think they're enjoying continuing to work together and going through things together. So those are some of the things we're really excited about right now. And then you mentioned King Steps earlier, but we're starting uh, the planning for <coughs> uh, training and support out the proxy organization. Wow. And then I would be happy to take any questions about the dashboard. You mentioned this in your report, but mm -hmm. uh, I know that with restraints, there are all sorts of uh, you know, checks you have to do. And, you know, put in the, and so it's always tough to get all of those. And if you miss one, that's it's, my counts is not you know, meeting expectations. But uh, and I know also, wasn't it, uh, was it Cody who was working on the Yes. yes, so I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. They did recently change the way they're reviewing the restraints charts. Um, <laughs> so Cody Saab is doing all the evening charts, where the past Jeff was doing them. Um, and they did revise a little bit kind of their, their bundle. Um, and so some of these, they're, they're working on revising the policy. So it was... The policy hasn't been approved yet, so he counted them at two of them as a fail, even though the revised policy is coming, they will be failed. Okay. So 
I think we're going to see the data change a little bit. Also, one of the things we're pursuing here is um, PMD offers specialized training about restraints, um, so that will be coming okay. as well. All right. So uh, work on it. Yes, um, and some of these were they weren't all the same thing this time, which was a little bit a little bit interesting too. Someone used a wrong order. Um, there was out of the many, many, many hours of documentation that you have to do, they missed three instances. So that counts as a failure for that right. for that patient on one of them. Um, and then uh, one of them was missing a care plan, which is a new process that they get initiated to help make sure that care plan gets put on the chart. But, and I think there was, they did something different with the order. So it, it got missed. Uh, there was not. There was not. Uh, I should know this, but uh, like you say, 13th possible in November. Is that 13 patients or is that 13 day uh, no. or however? I don't know. No, it's 13 Period. patients, okay. but one of those patients could have 24 hours or more of restraints. And for the age of the amount you have to document depends on the age of the patient. If they're an adult, you have to document at least every hour. If you miss just one, you miss the whole bundle. It's a zero. It counts as a zero in the denominator or the numerator. Um, and in one of these cases, too, I forgot that that was one of the reasons. There was a um, a pediatric patient where you have to, and it was an order renewal, not documentation. You have to renew the order more frequently than you do for adults. So um, the di the oversight was there, the care was there, but the order, the timing of it was just slightly off, and so that. Yeah, you know, the zero for that patient. Okay. That's a, a good point. So if somebody has a um, for time and let's say an hour mm -hmm. and the metric is everything's met for there, that's that'll count um, as a hundred percent. Yep. For somebody's here and I don't know how long typical restraints is, but how long it might last, but let's say 36 hours. I don't know if that's it's really possible. possible. And but any lapse of documentation in that time. It's they're yeah. weighted the same on one hour versus yeah. the 30s. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Didn't tell about that. Yeah. And um, you know, we thought about changing that, but the something like is the denominator every instance of a possible documentation, you know. But per, per restraint hour or something like that. But that this is traditionally how it's been it's been done. That's well, good context to, to know looking at this. Um, I did want to comment on hospital acquired infections and let you know that they have started the pre op decolonization for all of our um, moral popliteal bypass patients. So we're hopeful that that will, that will help on um, some of these surgical site conditions. There was something else I was going to add. Oh, in the pain medication reassessment after medication, I know there. Um, has been some charge nurse education and the charge nurse checklist has been updated and was rolled out at the beginning of December. So we, we won't see that data yet, but we're, I, that should help improve some of that. Um, they'll be checking a part of their checklist is to help check on whether that documentation was done for pain reassessment. Thank you. Uh, other questions? I would just better comment about the hospice average length of stay, mm -hmm. the third quarter of last year, that must have put a lot of uh, extra work on our hospice, going for hospice uh, uh, people, because uh, the average length of stay was 92 days, which is a whole month more than the average in the state of Washington. So the third quarter last year must have been quite uh, uh, aggressive for the, the hospice people. It actually goes the other way. Oh, really? Um, yeah, the shorter the length of stay, the more labor intensive because the start of care and the last few days are really the labor intensive part. Um, you see it as reflecting education. Uh, the number of hospice referrals we've had in the last six months that were on service less than 72 hours is staggering. Our, our census right now. Is consistently running in the mid 20s. Pandemic, it was typically in the mid high 30s. 
the number of admissions we're doing haven't changed. What's changed is the length of stay. And the number of people that we get either from KVH or from West Side facilities where um, the patient is essentially receiving life sustaining treatment in transport, uh -huh. uh, things like ventricular assist pumps. And the medics will bring the patient home, put them in their bed and turn the pump off, at which point their life expectancy is several hours. Um, and it's really kind of a shame because hospice is about education and support. Right. And we really aren't able to give families the full benefit of what we do if we show up um, at the very, very end of life. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. The, the other thing I wanted to comment about was the adverse medication events. Mm -hmm. It makes uh, it really nice to see that our hospital and our clinics are doing pretty well in preventing a patient from yeah. having an adverse event uh, from a medication uh, because uh, we're running at zero most of the time for both of those. So that's also very good. But that uh, also, uh, I feel, uh, shows uh, something that you don't normally talk about, but since the, the providers and the nurses and all that stuff are doing a good job helping patients not have adverse events with their medication, that means we're doing a good job educating them and telling them about other things they should do with their medication. So I'll be quiet now so we can move on. Thank you, Jerry. Any other questions or comments? Amanda? Thank you very much, Randy. All right, then we'll move on to the CEO report. Cheers. Yeah, um, I'm happy to answer questions, but first I wanted to start by congratulating Commissioner Clark, who was appointed to the Washington State Hospital Association Committee on Governance. So evidently he missed a meeting or deft an assignment. So <laughs> I think that starts next month for you, is that? Well, actually, uh, they've been chatting with me a lot because they were very excited about my nomination for you to become Julie Hopkins for the Hopkins Award. And they, uh, uh, we talked a lot about stuff and they said that they would like to have somebody uh, rep uh, representing another area on their governance committee that they could bring information in and then bring it back to to the, uh, the community. And since uh, we're a critical access world hospital, uh, that has the best CEO in the state of Washington based on that, we could probably do a little more helping other people with governance. So anyway, so that's uh, kind of what it is. They, they have a meeting um, about uh, once a quarter. Uh, it has going to be one on the 13th of February, and then they're also going to have another one up in Chelan uh, when they have the, the, the meeting up there. Uh, the other thing I thought was interesting was uh, the next day, although I, I wasn't going to be able to go to it on Valentine's Day, uh, they're having an advocacy uh, with the Washington State Hospital Association with our legislator, and there's 140 people associated with the Washington State Hospital Association going to talk to our legislators, and I uh, asked to see the minutes from our last meetings. And the one thing that I thought was interesting is they're trying to convince our legislators to increase what Medicaid pays uh, for uh, for healthcare in the state, especially to hospitals, to increase it a little bit more. But consequently, I uh, just thought it was really kind of interesting. And uh, they also still mentioned that they were very happy to have Julie win uh, that uh, award. So anyway. Well, congratulations. I think you tried to blame me for that nomination, but I get it. <laughs> no, no, I'm not blaming you for anything okay. because you're a wonderful hospital. Well, thank you. All right. Anyway, so if anybody has any questions or anything about that, uh, let me know it, and, and um, I'll be glad to chat with you. And... Congratulations, Terry. That's great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good job.
Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, ADH has been invited by the Department of Health to be part of a panel discussion high quality hires or something uh, at the upcoming Northwest Rural Health Conference. So no one from the senior leadership team has raised their hand quite yet. But uh, we'll see if somebody's going to be like Well, I'm going. I just don't know if I'm able to speak about like that. Yeah. 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 Which yeah. conference was that? Northwest Rural Health. I think we went together one year, Erica, your first year on the board, maybe. Oh, boy. In Spokane. Wait, 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 I, I remember it. Yeah. That's no yeah. conference. I just remember being very fire hose. He knows a lot of information. Yeah. It's very new. Is that like it? Okay. Okay, I'll plan on going uh, three years ago and then good news. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. The last thing I want to mention is that Rhonda Scott and I went up to Cleveland today, and after many months of trying to pull this off, we do have an opportunity to meet with the mayor. Uh, city plan, no, the city manager, because our attorneys and a planner up there talked about 47 degrees and about the concerns that both hospital districts one and hospital districts two have about the on the uh, impact that that project is going to have on us. So we had about two hours with them today um, and voiced our concerns and our frustration that um, we are not being heard by the environmental impact. So we don't think our our concerns are really being represented and we're kind of being shuttled off. So Rhonda's been point on that. Do you have any insights into today's meeting? You know, it really was great that they took the time to meet with us, and I think that they did listen. Um, I know our attorney Jamie Carmody was just a little concerned about um that they may be oh. releasing an addendum to the SEIS um, prior to receiving the application from Sun Countries. So he was really trying to push them to not release that first, but to have them release their application. And that's been a struggle because they haven't had a revised application. And so we don't really know what we're what we're asking or being asked to provide services for because you know we're just hearing what they have said in public meetings and that's been a challenge but overall I thought it was a productive meeting very happy they posted it I just want to highlight what she just said all of this work is pure speculation they have not given the city an application so the number of RV sites, the number of mobile homes, whether they would be owned or leased or the land would be leased or owned, all of that is simply stuff they've mentioned at public meetings that people are trying to plan. And again, that's what we're supposed to be determining what mitigation would be. So um, is that difficult <laughs> to ask what other plans are there should be no, an no, it's able to pull out and work with the environment. Maybe I was too close to you. The problem there, if I remember, was that uh, with such a dramatic change, it should have required a new application, but they just sort of said that it was just a revision of the existing one. Is that right? Yeah. So it's good to get in front of us. The bulk of my report this year is about this month, rather, this year, um, was on Women's Health, and Dr. Martin is going to provide some updates on the portion of his uh, report to the board. Um, but you see there that we are doubling down with Dr. Gibbs and Dr. Dawson and Dr. Martin working with CAT and some recruiting firms and um, bringing Stacey Botten on board to see what we can do to make sure that we're spending this year rebuilding and investing in our resources. But again, Dr. Martin will have some additional updates. And I did provide some information on uh, OB hospitals programs, which I think is one of the reasons we're having this. Yes, ma'am. Um, can I request or ask for assistance in when we talk about how we feel that this is a bigger problem than just BBH, just Ellensburg? I really would like to try to push into the Washington State Health Department, push into 
to the senators, push into ACOG and um, the American College of Research and Gynecology and AMA, American. And you try to help me write letters to talk about the state of rural health care and the state of rural OBGYN in health care. So I didn't know if this was an appropriate place to ask for help for that or if I need to go somewhere else. So that's all I'm on the table. So can I rephrase? Um, so yes. Um, I think the question to the board is you're, you're hearing from the medical staff, and I, I think Dr. Martin would echo this, is we would like to be able to represent KBH as being the voice of concern in addition to just our medical staff. So we can draft to the team to write letters to the state legislature and CMS and HRSA. Um, we will, um, we would like the board to know and, and like the board's authority to speak with the voice of KDH as well as individual providers. And Terry can hand deliver that on Valentine's Day when you're yeah. <laughs> Sure, I can, uh, I can uh, definitely uh, say this is something that the board should govern to buy. Uh, the, 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 about the OB coverage in our state. Well, like I think, I, I mean, the, the other board members can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the board is, is very supportive of you know, maintaining the service in the area. And uh, and if one way to do that is to is to sort of make noises in the right place, I think we'd be supportive of that. Help from lobbyists on who to write. It, it puts always key as who's on which committees, and really, what is the ask? What are we asking for? Um, but we're meeting regularly. The four of us will be getting back together, I think, next Friday. Um, but yeah, we can. If it, it would help to, uh, to get something from the board itself, uh, feel free to go run it by us. I'm sure that you know, once we you know, once we take a look at it, I'm sure we'd be happy to put our names to something. Unless, uh, I mean, anybody here have any questions? That's good. All right. That is your. Yeah. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any uh, questions for Julie? I have a, a question actually, since Dr. Dawson's here, uh, he feels like uh, one of my takeaways from this report that Julie included was uh, obviously recruiting really hard, but the cases are more difficult today on average than previous. So, is that what something you see also? Yeah, the acuity of patients are filling out. So I just talked to Stacey a few minutes ago. Our C section rate um, last, so 2022, we had 47 primary C sections. 2021, I may not be exact with the numbers, it was around like 30 something. 2020 was around 30 somewhat, 29, and then 24. So that rate is going up. And it's not because we're changing the way we practice. It's just our patients are requiring more care. So our overall C-section rate used to be around like 60 a year. And this last year it was 105. So yes. Thank you. So is that a norm, a 30% section rate? Uh, so would be nice. So if you're including repeat C-sections, yes, that's a norm. Primary C-sections, no, you want your C-section rate around 20, and I think ours is around 20, 23, something like that, so primaries. So I don't think we're, we're off on the national norms and state norms, but I would say the acuity of patients is rising. So for as long as I've been in medicine, it's been difficult to answer the question, what should C-section rate be? Right. Um, and, uh, a lot of factors, some of which include whether one's degree came from a medical school or a law school. Um, and probably the best benchmark that I've ever seen is the maternal and infant mortality in parts of the world where they don't have access to good prenatal care and don't have access to necessarily the surgical obstetrics is typically 12 to 15 percent. So there's a re that's a reasonable floor. It should probably be at least 15 percent. Um, otherwise, you're just taking chances. You probably don't need to change the paper to monitor baby. Um, lose access to better monitoring. Um, so the only changes that you know schema monitoring has added to the practice of obstetrics is um, higher C-section rate. It has not helped.
it, it's out of the uh, correlates strongly with the side of the settlements that are present. So we have had increased. Changes in guidelines on surgical care have increased the number of inductions, which probably increased the C-section rate some to treatment of gestational hypertension and diabetes. We can speculate on that. Something happened. The other thing I would say, and I might have mentioned this, um, we were able to with- Pretty short notice to get Dr. Glossop and myself and two other people at the hospital in front of the Department of Health to talk to about this and really wave the flag. Um, I, I think it is fair to say going into that meeting, the Department of Health saw um, Hopkins as an outlier. They were sort of stunned and appalled to hear that Hopkins had gone out of business so quickly. And the message from the collaborative hospitals that were there. Two of the collaborative hospitals since the beginning of the year have made the decision to get out of the labor and delivery business. And the other three were there to say, we are all at risk. That this, this is important. This is a huge gap and at risk gap for a rural facility. So I think the timing getting to the Department of Health is really important. And I'm just going to keep the collaborative point because they pulled that off in about two weeks. and and. We're reacting to us in the field saying we can't have this. Okay. I think this is one of those to uh, be continued. Yeah. And we'll get started. We appreciate updates, I think. Uh, any other questions for Julie? Can I ask her one more question? Yes. So when you were explaining that, uh, it sounds like you said that the, the prenatal care. Increased the number of C sections we're having. So, continuous fetal monitoring, which came out probably, correct me if I'm wrong, 1980s, 90s, um, studies proved that the biggest change in prenatal care that that caused was the increased C section rates. Oh, the, it's, it's, the, the, it's, it's the prenatal <laughs> monitoring. It's during labor. Okay. It's during labor, it's and that, that increased the amount of C sections. Is it is it provided with more reasons to write them? I'm sure it's more things to point out. Oh, because they have more data to look at that they didn't have before. Is it revealing babies in distress? Is that is that is that what we would hope? But um, the studies have not completely um, shown that. Too much information. Is it a bell that just can't be unrung when the evidence isn't supporting it? Okay, well, thank you very much for commenting for that. Okay. Thank you. Amanda would like to. Yeah, sure. Since um, our usual monthly metrics, this is also the end of the report since it was December 22. I just wanted to point out a couple of things that um, at 2021, our turnover rate was 24.79%. And at the end of the year for 2022, we actually dropped almost 5% in our turnover. So I just I thought that was interesting. We also um, have the highest number of employees we've ever had. Um, we went from September in 2022 to be 715, and we're all like, wow, we broke 700 employees. So now we're at 746. And again, that's outdated from when I submit this report with, the, as you saw, our HR metrics board. So just want to mention that since it's the end of the report is in addition to the monthly report. That's great. The turnover yeah. uh, drop. What do you attribute that to? You know, I think a couple of things. Um, 2021, if you remember, there was a lot going on with the state mandate. Um, people did choose to leave. I have a big Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all forget that, right? Just, uh, I don't think I'll ever forget that in my career. But, um, and so we, we did lose staff, you know, that they did resign over that. So that was one aspect. But also in 2022, I mentioned in my report that we completed four contract negotiations as well. And so we got all of our wage matrix updated. and. As you see in our reports, uh, we've, we've improved our benefits rates um, for families and part time staff. We've had a lot of just really great news this year to be able to um, sell candidates and kind of even if it's what's ahead for 2023. So, um, and we've seen our applicant pool um, increase a little bit as well. So, great moving on. That's uh, great to see. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Any questions for Megan? Thank you very much. Thank you. It's uh, good to hear about all that. Uh, good stuff. Okay, next up.
Then we have uh, the operations report, and we'll stop start with uh, Vicky Machado. Vicky. Hi there. Good evening. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I think you have the report there in front of you, hopefully. I don't really have anything to add um, other than um, we are extremely busy on the inpatient side. Uh, med surge and CCU, we've, this is the first time that I recall that we, we've been able to not admit patients that we should have admitted because we have no room, um, we had no beds. Uh, so we're becoming that hospital that's looking to, you know, for inpatient care. Um, the patients are just sicker, they're lasting longer, and it's very difficult to place. Um, a lot of them, the disposition is the key, key issue. Um, surgery continues to be, uh, we've been able to accommodate all our surgical patients, which is great. And uh, that seems to be going okay. Um, ER is about the only department that's kind of resumed its pre-COVID state. Uh, over the last two to three weeks, their census has been what it was pre-COVID. Uh, so the staff are getting a little, a little bit of reprieve. Um, still a large uh, group of mental health patients that require a lot of resources and disposition issues as well in the ER. Um, I'll be open to any questions. Any questions about Vicky's report? I um, have a question. I was wondering if you could speak a little more about the beta site for badge in and out. This is, is this the, um, what's the name for it? Thank you. Is that what we're talking about here? Right. So uh, that department is being, that project is piloted in OB because it's a smaller unit and um, just an area to, to capture the, um, the challenges with that. Jeff, um, do you, can you add to that, how that's yeah. going? This yeah, so, yeah, it's going very well. Um, we started with one st workstation um, initially. Now we're up to eight. Um, and as, as Vicky mentioned, it is a pilot right now. Once we get the equipment uh, in both data centers and we have a redundancy for that, then we'll push it out uh, wider uh, to other departments. Um, you know, to med surge, ED, uh, they're all already asking for it, um, but we don't want to push it out until we have uh, more redundancy in the system. So, and work out a lot of the bugs um, that initially come up uh, as we do this. So, has anybody given feedback saying that, you know, no thanks, I'd rather enter my class <laughs> No, no we're, <laughs> we're doing great. The other piece of this is from a security risk. Um, because we still use um, generic logins in certain areas, especially clinical areas. And so, so that automatically uh, eliminates any generic logins once we get this rolling out um, for employees. So, so that takes off another uh, item that we have on our security risks as well, so. Excellent, I'm really excited about this. Thank you. Yep. The else? staff are too. <laughs> Anything else for Vicky? So, so Vicki, you, you'd said that um, sometimes we don't have room to admit people, is that correct? Yes, what, yes. What happens to those individuals if we don't have room? Uh, some of them uh, we will hold overnight and then try to find room in the morning. If they require a more um, urgent need, uh, we will call around just like every other place uh, in the state. We have a whole list of um, hospitals. And if we cannot get them on our own, we will uh, push that out to the WMCC to help with finding an open bed somewhere. Uh, it has seemed to not taken as long as it has um, since last fall. So beds are a little bit better or we're seeing that we're able to get patients. However, Case in point, we have a patient on med surge who's been waiting for two days, been accepted at Swedish First Hill, I think, and another hospital on the west, west side, but they have no beds. So he's sitting here waiting. Um, so it, it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Yeah. And we're busy because of COVID-related issues, RSV, no. or other thing like... Like, can we expect, is this transitory? Is this gonna peak and then diminish or is this the new normal? I, I wish I knew. It's been the, the new normal for about two to three months now, wouldn't you say, Scott? I think that's, that's uh, and, and it's not, it's rare that it's COVID. Uh, we have a, 
a COVID patient, they're usually incidental findings just because we test them. It's not because they're symptomatic. It's elderly folks, uh, a lot of pneumonia, a lot of infections, uh, uh, multi-system failures, uh, heart disease. It's just, there's not just one thing that's really prevalent. Month, month, nearly. I, I, it's almost every day the, the meds are yeah. as, as 13 beds. So we've had 13 patients in the beds. And then we, uh, I think ICU has five or four. Uh, currently, they have five. And there's six beds in ICU. And then at birthplace, they go from zero to 60. And zero to 60. <laughs> we, we had made plans early in the pandemic to be able to expand our capacity past 50 beds. And we still have the equipment to do that, but we don't have the staff. The staff is not the choke point, and that's true statewide. Uh, a lot of what's impacting us is the fact that the West Side hospitals are full and they can't discharge people. Uh, and it's just, just had the ripple effect. Precisely. And, we're taking patients from other critical access hospitals. They're taking patients from us. We're, we're, it, it's kind of a shell at this point. I also believe we are admitting patients with RPG that we went back when it was more convenient to transfer. Um, you know, the, the other piece uh, that is cause for hope is that for a long time, we simply could not get anybody to Yakima. And in the last week or so, we are getting some patients to go to Memorial, um, which is good because that means it's three phone calls instead of 41. Thank you, Vicki. I appreciate the information. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you very much, Vicki. Moving on, uh, Ron Old, Chief Ancillary Officer. Hello, everyone. Uh, my report is on page 36 and 37. Um, the thing that I would like to add is to make sure that you did see the press release from Kittitas County that they're holding the joint uh, meeting between the county commissioners and the Playalum City Council and Mayor. That's on Monday, the 30th of January at 530. Um, they've got some pretty good topics if you were able to look at that agenda. So I think it'll be an, an interesting meeting. I know I'm going and uh, Hospital District 2 Commissioner Ingrid Vimont has indicated she wants to attend as well. And we'd love to have any of you there. Any questions? Just, uh, Justin, would you mind emailing everybody just uh, with that information? Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I can forward that to you all. And if you click on a link in it, it does have the agenda. Great. So you guys have all had a chance to review Margaret's report. Are there any questions about the report? I was going to ask about the PIXIS. Um, looks like it's getting ready to be implemented. Is there any concerns or uh, is it uh, doing what you want at this point as we get ready to transition to the new PIXIS? Um, it's doing what we want um, at this point. I think there has been a delay in some of the barcode scanning in clinics that was supposed to be earlier in February or earlier later this month, and now it's pushed off to February. Is that right, Stacy? That is correct, February 14th. Yeah, a lot of new equipment and people to train on how to use it. Can I ask um, Jeff and, and Rhonda both to talk a little bit about AMRA? Do I have that correct? The imaging application that has recently gone live for us? Yeah, this is a, um, a new product that we have that allows us to share images with other hospitals without having to create a VPN. So we can push the images um, to, to facilities that will agree to allow us to do that. Um, it's also really great because patients can sign up uh, for access to AMBRA um, and then they can also through an email link open up their particular um, image studies. So if they find themselves at a provider's clinic and the provider says, I didn't get your images, um, they can click on the link that they have and be able to pull those up in the doctor's office. So we're really excited about it. We've um, been trying to, you know, get this operational for several years now. And, you know, I think COVID has 
uh, kept us from doing a lot of things that we wanted to do, but it's working now. And we've been able to add hospitals. Um, we recognized the ER noticed that we're sending more and more patients to Spokane, which typically that's not our referral area. Um, it, would, it used to in the past, we didn't send hardly anyone there at all. Uh, so we didn't have a VPN connection with them. Um, but since that's been brought to our attention, we've reached out to them and we've already been able to quickly establish a connection with them for AMBRA. And then we have put some emails out to the providers to just say, what are the other referral patterns that have happened that we're seeing with COVID? Um, so we're reaching out to the hospitals that we've been sending patients to in Idaho um, and trying to get that AMBRA connection with them as well. And I just really wanted an opportunity to thank Jeff and Rhonda and Kenny because um, we received a verge report. This is process improvement working the way it's supposed to from a PCT in the emergency department who noticed that because we were not able to do this, Sacred Heart was not accepting a patient probably. So she wrote a verge saying, we really need to be able to do this. We had a quick conversation and, and Jeff said, well, you know, watch this. <laughs> and Kimmy and Rhonda and, and Jeff were able to support it. So it was a real win for an employee who wanted things to be better for the patient. And functionally, it just, I mean, we were like cutting a CD, and I'm thinking, a play? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this was a wonderful win, I think, for yep. process improvement and also for patients. How much time elapsed between when that bird was submitted and now? Well, I wrote it tonight. That was last yeah. week. Oh, yeah. so, one, two, lightning. Okay, yeah. right. So, yeah, it was just a couple of days it took us to get that created, I think, wasn't it, Jeff? Yeah, yeah. As soon as they brought it to our attention to getting it completed. So, um, I'm really happy that they put the Verge in and brought it to our attention because we wouldn't have known that otherwise. So, really great work. Yeah, it's great to hear about, uh, about those opportunities that, that come up. Uh, good work. Thank you. All right. Next up, uh, Stacey Olea, Chief uh, Clinic Operations. The only change I have is we now have four candidates for clinic director of nursing, two internal um, and two external. And one of our externals was one of our traveling RNs we had up in the Clio. Club. So we start interviews tomorrow and should have them completed by February 10th. So we are really excited. And you can get a good selection of candidates. Absolutely. Yeah. We are really excited about the candidates for the role. Otherwise, I have nothing else to add, and I'm happy to answer questions. Any uh, questions for Stacey? Uh, I was just going to ask the uh, internal medicine the MAs that are moving to 10 hour shifts and mm -hmm. stuff. I've seen that in a few places. Is this quality of life sort of? It's a balance of quality of life. It also is because the providers are there 10 hours. And what was happening is the MA would work an eight hour shift and go home. Providers stay and work piled up for the MA. And by the MA working five eights, they're basically working from clinic door open to clinic closed, focusing on the patients coming in the door. The 10 hour shift is giving them more time to spend on those clerical tasks that happen. Results come in. Patients yeah. need to be called with that. And all of the medication refills. So it's a little bit of both. Any resistance from the MAs on this sort of change, or do they somewhat embrace it? It is something that they've been asking for. And we actually had, before we started this, we had some MAs move out to um, the farmers clinic because they were offering four beds and we were not. So they've been really happy with it. The providers have also been very supportive of the change. All right. Thank you. Uh, did you have a question? Really Go quickly, uh, anecdotally speaking, I've had some opportunities to call um, for medicine, but I'm not doing the improvement aspect of it. So Thank I you. just wanted to thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, we were uh, glad to hear about those. Yeah, and Terry and I were able to attend uh, one of the big brainstorming sessions. It was really fun to just work with everybody for a couple hours, hearing all the ideas and the challenges and learning that they behind the scenes stuff. So thank you for that insight. Thank Great. you for attending. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, Terry, did you have? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Yamada is our Chief Information Officer. Jeff? Yep. Uh, my report, I believe, starts on page 17. Um, really, the highlights is, uh, so this is year end. Um, and so for year, for 2022, 
we completed um, 59 projects um, as we built out our um, project management um, kind of uh, services. Um, I, I think from, uh, I got the numbers from back in 2019, we started with uh, 28 projects completed for the year. 2020, we had 45. We implemented some software, um, smart sheets that helped us to organize and uh, push projects a little more efficiently. Um, and so 2021, we finished with 60. And then uh, this last year, we finished uh, with 59. So we're pushing a lot of projects, big and small projects. Um, a lot of the projects that you're hearing about, Pixis, um, you'll be hearing shortly about um, our PAX replacement. Um, and that's, we're replacing three major pro uh, products within our PAX. And so that's probably about a nine month project altogether. Uh, so a lot of projects going on on, on that front. Um, along with, you know, badge tap and some of these others. So we're also in the background um, implementing a lot of equipment, um, backup solutions, um, redundancy for our badge tap, um, and that will continue on kind of in the background. Um, Stacy talked about med scanning. That's another huge project that we're currently running through and doing, um, doing the training as we speak. Um, so that's going as well. Um, on top of that, we are continuing our cybersecurity risk. Uh, our continual email phishing uh, is developing as well. And so we see a reduction in our um, phishing prone percentages uh, in our, I think we're at month eight or nine in our program. And our goal was to be um, below 5% um, by, by a 12 months uh, you know, as we're into this for 12 months, and that's basically best practice if we can get to below 5%. Uh, I know a lot of uh, more individuals are reporting um, any suspicious emails, and so that's great as well. And so that'll continue on um, probably forever as we continue this. So um, outside of that, I think that's the big ones. Uh, we are in the end stages and we should see the draft for our annual security risk assessment um, that um, has now completed and we're just waiting for the draft report to show up. Uh, we'll have some meetings and then uh, at some point we'll have our um, final report as we work through um, some of the other um, vulnerabilities that we continue to have. Um, but that's that's uh, reducing as we speak as well. So um, those are the major pieces. And then you already heard about uh, VDI and badge tap. So. I have a question for you, Doug. The 5% figure that you say is best practice. 5%. But what is the 5%? So um, this, this program it does really well. And so you can break down by industry. So we're, um, we're in healthcare and you can also break down by the number of employees. And so I think we're in the 250 to 1000 uh, group size for our organization. Um, and then um, from that, then you can put in how long or the maturity of your, your program. And so currently I have it in for one year. And so best practice out of all of those industries is, uh, to be at 5%. And so, so 5% of what's happening or what metric? 5% of the number of employees that you have. So how many people are actually still clicking? Oh. Um, is, so you're reducing that number. Um, okay. Yeah. I want to know who the six <laughs> clicked on every stinking <laughs> We have their names. <laughs> Five, that seems really high. I still. do not have their names. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. I'm surprised that industry, the goal is below 5%. That's considered good? That's considered, yeah, that's considered you're you're doing, uh, you know, well across the board with the other industries, other hospitals in that same space. So um, I appreciate the work yeah. you guys are doing on this. I, I get excited when I see those come through. I'm like, oh, they're, they're, they're fish, or yeah. fish bait. I don't know what it is, but it's yeah. really cool. I think what you can see um, is people are getting a little bit more familiar with them. So now you know right away when you see one, right? So um, those are coming up as well. 
Any other questions for Jeff? I was just going to ask real quick the first couple of items on your report the uh, implemented the I rhythm and implemented the Zion patch. I'm just if there's anything you can elaborate, what, what does that mean to implement? What, what changes or what additions do we bring to the those two cardiology related items if, if you know offhand? Yeah, so that's just uh, additional programs, software programs that we've um, implemented to that to cardiology. And so that is. Um, stress tests, and I believe that is um, um, Dr. Hoppy is reading some of the, the pacemakers that our uh, patients have. And so instead of them having to go to the hospital that those pacemakers were implanted in, uh, they can now be done locally here um, and go into a database. And so those are just additional programs that we're adding, adding to our services. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jeff. You're welcome. Uh, next up, we have Ron Erlocker, Chief Facilities. His board report is on page 47. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I don't have any significant updates to that uh, report. Um, what's new in, in this quarterly report is the workplace violence data. And there was some interest from the board to kind of see the breakdown of, of what that looked like. So, um, if you have any questions on that, we have to field those. So the, the portable MRI will be uh, up and running in the next month or two. Is that on track? Well, I'm really hoping next month. Um, so the the canopy is is ready to go. Um, it's not complete. They'll complete it after the MRI unit is in place, just to make it a little bit easier to pull that trailer in there. So there's a little bit of work that happens after it's in there. It, that trailer is in DOH review. Um, every single trailer is supposed to be reviewed by LNI for electrical safety and then DOH. And so DOH has promised that they would review it by the end of January. So we're hoping by next week that review will have taken place um, and that it's approved. And so once that happens, Alliance has said that it will take them a week to mobilize the unit and get it here. And then uh, from there, we would have another week, um, uh, you know, setting it up. They have um, some calibrations to do for the magnet, you know, for the environment that it's in and then training. And then um, at that point, we can demo the old one. So I'm, you know, to answer your question, I certainly hope by the end of February, we're we're using that. And uh, the Walker construction contract for the expansion project, uh, everything seems to be on track, no surprises or anything, or any, anything to report on that uh, project? Yeah, no, no big surprises yet. They're kind of in a holding pattern. Um, they can't really do much of anything until uh, that old, um, the modular MRI is, is out of there. Um, so we're also working with an alliance. They're supposed to be in contract with VK Pal to demo that old building. And uh, as of yet, I don't think they have a signed contract, or at least they haven't confirmed that. Um, so we've been pushing them on that. But um, they have set up some um, instrumentation around the, the building where the addition goes and um, taking uh, field measurements and it, it's a very accurate instrumentation and so they um, find the deviations from what the plans show and you know where that comes into play is when they order their steel they order those to exact measurements so they're uh, um, working on getting those refined thank you Beth. Well, the last year's table we have a new build that prohibits open carry on our campus and um, Ron did implement, right, and implement that policy, and it's in our safety policies now. So. Would that count as contraband that as well? No. Yeah. That's not strictly drug paraphernalia. Yeah. Okay. Open carry. Open carry is not part of that. Explain to me what an open carry is. Uh, so open carry is a legal definition. So you can't carry a firearm on your hip in the office. Oh, oh you're yeah. talking about. Uh, uh, yep. Ammunition and guns. Correct. Oh, okay. Okay. Booze. 
I'm going to take a baby of it. A glass of wine. Yeah. Okay. Can, you have, can you have one seal? Yeah. Okay, so here we go for that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted yeah. to comment on page 49 that the total number of work orders created annually, that's an astounding number of work orders. How, how many people are on the staff to respond to these work orders? Um, six. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's... Wow. Um, Tara that will will do a few. Um, she's responsible for a few PMs, and then I pick up some. But by and large, it's six. That's incredible. Good job. Thank you. So, oh, the work orders. So, I'm just this graph here, these blue bars, um, almost reaches the seven thousand number for the business annual. So, um, here it's broken down to by month, in, in year, I just, that's so many, but you guys are hopping. Yes, we are. <laughs> 2022 looked like it was maybe 5,300 or so for quarters. Okay. Yeah. That's, wow. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Welcome. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, next up. <laughs> is uh, medical staff reports. First up, we have Chief of Staff, Dr. Hoppe. We saw Dr. Hoppe on, on the screen a couple minutes ago. Dr. Hoppe, are you there still? I'm there. Good, good uh, timing, by the way. Perfect. Yeah, I'm just uh, multitasking, reading some echoes here in the background. So, <laughs> so the anyway. uh, list of, uh, of files for credentialing, that's up 59. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hoppe. Go ahead. Uh, no, I just want to let you know we had uh, five uh, people that had initial appointments approved and seven for reappointments. So, yep. I have nothing uh, so further to add. Yeah, and everybody's had a chance to review these files, I assume, on the board. Uh, are there any uh, questions or concerns before we uh, move to approve this list? Right, do I have a motion to approve the, the list for the initial appointments and the reappointments? Okay. Motion from uh, Erica. I'll second. Second from Terry. Uh, there's no further discussion then. All those in favor of approving these uh, initial appointments and reappointments as listed on page 59, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Anything uh, else, Dr. Hoppe? Is that all you need from us? That's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Nothing makes a year seem to go by faster than seeing a name come back up on reappointment. <laughs> like it was a month ago. Yeah. Years ago. Yeah. All right. Next up, then we have our chief medical officer, Dr. Martin. Well, here's Dr. Martin. Depending on which numbering system your packet has, my report begins on either page 36, 56, or 60. 60 for us. 60 for us. Yeah. Um, so I do have a couple things to add to the report. Um, since uh, this report went to press, our absolute highest burning priority is making sure that we have our anesthesia services staff. We've had some very encouraging conversations uh, and uh, think that we're going to be able to uh, have coverage and plenty of time to keep services running. Secondly, our absolute hottest, highest priority uh, OBGYN. Uh, uh, a week ago today, we received resignation. So we are no longer recruiting for two permanent providers, we're recruiting for three. Uh, we've got several locums agencies that we've uh, retained. We're working with several search agencies, uh, including uh, something that we've never really done before, which is venture boldly into the 21st century. There is a platform uh, that is essentially a LinkedIn for healthcare providers called Voximity. Uh, and they have a, a subsidiary that specializes in recruitment. Uh, they uh, will identify uh, likely candidates based on what else they're using their phone for. One of those insidious little you think you have privacy then. Um, and, and try to put our postings in front of the most likely applicants. Uh, they will be coming out on site to visit us. Um, 
been interesting that I don't think you've ever had the cruisers visit us until the last three months. And Adaptive Medical Partners has been out there with us. Not forever blank. Oh, Curie um, is the subsidiary. They'll be coming out and paying us a site visit. Uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we are working to retain locums for DMs. Uh, we're continuing to recruit. Uh, we're also looking at possibly working with a staffing agency uh, to get right into it. And finally, our absolute highest, hottest emergency priority is, in fact, the emergency department. That seems to have stabilized somewhat. Uh, we've had good cooperation with the emergency assistance of Yakima. Uh, as of right now, uh, we are fully staffed through the end of February, which doesn't sound like a big accomplishment unless you've been losing more sleep. Uh, but, uh, and Dr. Germani and uh, Dr. Schmelzer of EUY are working on coordinating a March schedule to make sure that we have uh, adequate coverage there. Uh, any questions for Dr. Martin about uh, his report or his, his update? Just a comment about Dr. Germani and the way he has stepped up and the, just the enormous amount of work that he's done for us and, and what a pleasant and hardworking guy. And I think the staff is really, really, really important. Yeah, and to put it in perspective, he's taken on the, emergency, the interim medical director role. In addition to the end, uh, to put this in perspective, a fully employed ED physician typically pulls 13 shifts a month. Dr. Germani typically pulls 15. In December, he pulled 22. Um, while taking on the administrative duties, while being an absolute delight. Um, I met with him yesterday. He's identified some staffing issues uh, in the way the emergency department is currently staffed. That, so he's thinking about the systems level as well as just getting in the trenches. And um, I've lost a lot more sleep uh, as your support has provided. Please pass along our thanks, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Provider enrollment specialist. Is that a new position or was it previously no. occupied by somebody else? It was. We originally filled that position, I want to say, last spring. And uh, our first hire uh, lasted about six months. Uh, it's a more complicated position. The work is more complicated than I think she realized or the, than we did because that was something that we'd outsourced. Um, the current uh, hire is approaching with a lot more sophistication and has uh, already been able to automate some processes that were essentially manual after six months previously. Uh, and this is what two weeks on the job. Is this addressing um, reporting insurance contracts? Yes. And so, insurance? one of the, there's a, a few things to that position does. The first is um, when we bring on a new hire, we have to give them credential. So they have to have a license, a DEA number proof of malpractice. Uh, a lot of payers want to see 10 years of malpractice claims. There are uh, two platforms that are intended to replace all of the individual applications that historically we've had to do. One of them is mandated by Washington State, one of them is federal. They both have to be kept current. And oh, by the way, everybody that is supposed to be covered by the two all encompassing ones. Necessarily so. Uh, so, for, for every provider, those have to be updated and maintained. Uh, when I first started in practice, you had to update annually. Uh, when I came here, it was quarterly. It's now down to every 60 days. So, somebody has to go in and fetch those records every 60 days. And then they've set it up so that it's not enough to have a delegated staff person, but there are actually things that the provider themselves have to sign off on on every reattestation. Um, which is just a way of making it more difficult for people to keep getting paid. Um, so uh, having somebody that can handle the bulk of that work, uh, wrap it up, put a nice ribbon on it, and send it to the provider with a link that says, you know, here's what you have to do to reattest. Um, 
and the provider, once that link is sent, has 24 hours to respond or else the link goes dead. So uh, that frequently gets done two or three times per provider. Um, it's She's doing a lot of work and she's learning it quickly. Glad to hear that. And in fact, I'm learning a lot about the work because, like I said, we outsourced it. So uh, when I first became CMO, what we did for credentialing to check the status of credentialing was somebody would say, call Julia. And we would call Julia, and eventually she would call us back. And, um, uh, over time, she became less, that agency became less and less responsive, and that's why we brought it in. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, any last uh, questions for Dr. Martin? Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. Right, next up, we have our uh, CFO report, Scott Oler. Thank you. The, um, there was a separate handout in the uh, December report that was uh, sent separately. Uh, just to start off, I wanted to uh, Acknowledge and thank Jason and Kelly and the accounting department for uh, these financial statements together. There was uh, the least accounting changes that were part of this. Uh, is the largest, most significant change in accounting <coughs> in, in this, I don't know how long, many, 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 many years. Mark the market. Mark, yeah, that was not, but it was, it was a significant change. And uh, it took just an incredible amount of work to, uh, to put this together. And uh, and so, anyway, just uh, they really worked hard to get these uh, this, this this change accomplished. And uh, wanted to acknowledge and thank them for for that. Thank you. Um, if we can start on page seven, that is. Um, just the stats. So this is one of those months where you can work very, very hard and not have um, a particularly good uh, financial results report. And so, um, line one, um, there's no complaint about patient volumes. Uh, we're over budget on admissions, significantly over budget on patient days. Uh, uh, acuity on line eight, uh, 1.23 case mix. So, uh, reflects the, uh, the illness of uh, the patients that we've been caring for, inpatient procedures over budget, outpatient procedures over budget. For some reason, people decided not to have colonoscopies around uh, Christmas and New Year's. You need to run the show. <laughs> we, need, uh, we, we need to point out that we can function both as a friend and a weight loss. <laughs> But anyway, um, it's uh, it's ramped back up, and so we're doing um, we're very busy with that again. ER, as, as Vicky mentioned, is has was very busy. Urgent care, um, MNG, um, really the only uh, variance here, and it's due to staffing, was with rehab visits, um, and that was uh, that is starting to improve as uh, uh, as our rehab provider is able to. Uh, start to recruit them and attract patients. You can see down on line 28, the clinics were uh, very busy for the month. So the organization was uh, was busy. Uh, you will see a, a very nice positive revenue variance uh, when we get to the financial statements. On the last line 39 on here, uh, you see that our day's cash on hand went uh, way up. We were about 195 days last month and up to 246. That is the borrowing that occurs of the $15 million that we borrowed for the expansion um, project. So, base cash. And if you jump over to page 10, that is uh, the um, statement of revenue and expenses. So, with those stats, you see a um, you would expect a positive revenue variance, and you and that manifests itself at $1.5 million positive variance. Year to date, uh, $4.1 million. Um, our issue was expenses this last month. And um, the, uh, the most troublesome one is the temporary labor, uh, $858,000 negative variance there. We spent almost a million dollars on temp labor. 
And year to date, we spent almost $6.7 million on and uh, that, um, or, um, you know, salaries was over budget. Most of the variance related to salaries was related to uh, staffing in the ER, both uh, professional staffing and clinical staffing. Um, some of the unusual swings uh, related to the, uh, the uh, adjustment for the lease accounting. On rents and leases, there is a negative expense of uh, seven hundred thirty-three thousand dollars for the month, and uh, that expense shifted up into a couple. Of, uh, it shifted up to depreciation. Uh, depreciation normally runs about three hundred fifty thousand dollars for the month. It is for the month of the December one point six million. The other change is uh, in interest expense. It normally ran about uh, forty-eight thousand dollars a month. It was uh, two hundred thirty thousand dollars. And then uh, purchase services was uh, actually, although they're over budget, it was a, there's a lot of purchase services that went through here and some of the purchase services expenses shifted from um, down into depreciation and interest also. So that uh, we end up with a, uh, an operating uh, loss of 441,000. And then uh, just on the, uh, in the non-operating, there was a lot of uh, activity so um, that uh, it's a $538,000 negative variance. However, there was, um, in, in my report, there was, um, there was a, a PEM uh, liability adjustment that uh, we talked about when we budgeted last year. Uh, initially, we thought it would come in about $6 million. It came in at $3.8 million. Jason was uh, twisting the arm of the actuaries and probably dropped it by a million, million and a half. And then just questioning some of the methodology, are we using the right interest rate factor? What if you, and so that, uh, so that came down. So that's a, a $3.8 million expense. If you get up to that, we haven't cleared that with Nancy. <laughs> so I, it's kind of, we don't do a performance based comp, it's market based. Um, good job. Yeah. Another, another unusual item that is in that uh, non operating expense bucket is uh, we had two, $201,000 of debt issuance costs related to the uh, $15 million that we borrowed. Initially, we thought that might be around three hundred thousand dollars, but it came in lower. It, we had two point two five million dollars of provider relief money that had been deferred, but we had not recognized that was income. And then we recognized the three hundred ninety-seven thousand dollars of the uh, inter, um, legislative grant for the right extension that. Uh, we haven't received the funds yet, but we have earned it and we will receive those funds. Um, our energy efficiency project is uh, about 49% completed. And so um, we recognize 49% of the $500,000 Department of Commerce grant that we received. We'll receive, we don't have the funds on that. And we do have funds for the Sunderland grant of $250,000. We've had those on our bank for a while, but we recognize 49% of those income. Um, we also recognize that they're up in the expense area. There was uh, repair expense related to the damage to the family birthplace that happened. And so we're going to get an insurance recovery of $200,000 for that. So we recognize that income we approved for that. Um, interest expense, interest, or excuse me, interest income on some of the hospital's investments is uh, was 56,000. And then we had also $119,000 of unrealized. So for the month, we recognize had a, a loss of $946,000. Year to date, um, our net income is four million seventy nine thousand. The compared budget of six point nine million. Um, 
that budget number did not include the PEB adjustment. So we're actually comparing apples and oranges a little bit. The, uh, that 6.9 um, excluded uh, the uh, PEB adjustment. So the numbers that I'm reporting that 4 million included. So uh, if, you, if we were to Apples to apples, it would be about a, a seven point eight million dollar um, yeah. So a lot of activity uh, this last month. I just want to bump you over to page page nine, and do you see on the the cash and investments that twelve months uh, report the. The orange line is the day's cash, and you see the, uh, the, the cash that we called went uh, way, way up. The green bar is money in the uh, local government improvement pool. And uh, for a long time, the rate of interest on funds in that pool were almost nothing. Um, in November, they were at 3.8%, 3.7%. And in December, they were almost at 4%. So, and this is money that we can pull down next day. Uh, so it's very, very liquid, and we're getting a good rate of return. The green, or the blue bar, is our cash, and uh, the cash in the cash in our Valley Bank. And we have, um, we've moved, we've invested some of that cash into. Uh, Government securities on the red bar. So you see a growth in the red bar, a decrease in the blue bar. To, uh, so we're trying to, uh, to uh, earn as much money on our uh, the hospital's funds as we possibly can. And those those checks that we write that we see at the beginning of the report, those come out of the cashmere account. Yes. So, so we can't go significantly lower than this because we're constantly moving cash in and out of there to pay our bills and yeah. stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we don't usually look too much at the balance sheet, but uh, we have that is on page 11. And um, on our, um, if, you, if, you, if you see, you see uh, our cash at the end of the year, $11,162,000. Last year at this time it was $25 million. And so that cash has what well, if you look down on in the investment line, we uh, were at $35 million in investments and now we're at 61 million. So we have shifted a lot of money down from cash to investments. And that investment includes the the government instruments and the LGIP pool of funds. So it's both the combination of those two is the investments. The property plan equipment, and it says and ROU, um, it's um, right of use asset. That is where the the new lease leases, uh, the value of those lease um, liabilities that we have, we have a right to use that asset. And so that's where the increase came up in there. And then uh, down uh, just below, if you see the deferred liabilities line, the first line below that says long-term LTV right of use asset, four million nine hundred ninety-one thousand. That is the hospital's liability related to those uh, lease obligations that we have for the next while. I think it's a, that also includes building, so that's primary care and the physical therapy, ETOT. Then you see under, just below the long term debt line, we have other post employment benefit liability, $3,806,000. That's where that liability And as your call, if the, if the hospital decides to do that, that, is, uh, that comes back to its Any questions related to the financial statement? Was was that enough of an explanation, Bob, on the leases? Or? Yeah. Um, sure anybody else have any questions on the policy change? 
it's the drama that happened in this one report going forward it's now stabilizing yes yeah. Yeah. then on the last page on the statement cash flow um, you see a net change in cash up on the bottom of the third line from the bottom it says uh, net change in cash 14 million dollars uh, in bracket so it's a decrease in cash it's literally Cash in Cashmere Valley Bank, but our overall cash investments is uh, uh, up significantly because of the debt. Any uh, questions? Well, some of our debt, you know, the interest is like point zero one. Well, the investments. Yeah. So those we got to time out for a year. Um, I wish they were shorter. Um, uh, the next one that matures, uh, investment that is maturing is, I think, June of 2023. And some of the other investments are 24. So we, uh, in the finance committee, we see that schedule and um, uh, investments. And uh, we have uh, uh, the next one that matures, and it's it's a uh, we have uh, an investment that we made in uh, eight of March of 2022, and our yield on that investment was 1.1 percent, and it was two million, just over two million dollars. That will mature on June 15 of 2023, and then we'll be the it will be reinvested at. Uh, what we've been the rate that we've been investing at is 4.4, 4.3 percent on the new the, the more recent investments that have had occurred in the last couple of months. And then the on those, if you were to cash out of those, you, you'd pay penalty. You can't, you, you can't, you can't, we're, we're locked in. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and you see, as, as you're referring to, we've got some. 0.37 percent, less than a third of one percent, two to three. And you know, at the time, these were the yeah. best rates were available. Which should have planned that. Let's yeah, predict the future. <laughs> That's really <pretty> true. <laughs> um, if there are no other questions, we do have one. Uh, yes. So, Scott, just uh, one quick. It's not a question, but it's about the capital expenditure request. If there's no. Uh, uh, opposition, I assume there would be from the from the board. We will want to add this to the uh, agenda. So we will we'll want to put the capital expenditure request on the uh, on the agenda for this yeah, month. Motion, motion to add the agenda. Or yeah, I mean, yeah, I suppose we could, but uh, we have a motion to amend the agenda to just add the capital expenditure request. I'll move to, to add the capital expenditure. Second. Motion yeah. seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please say. Uh, all right. All right. So I just want to make sure that that gets on there since uh, since we want to have it reflected. The agenda. Uh, go ahead. Scott. So this is a, a piece of equipment. Uh, you get an X-ray machine, and uh, Kenny. Um, this is the cost of buy a house at seventy-four seventy-four thousand dollars, and uh, it has a function life for us. Uh, Kenny thinks it's good technology. It will last. Another five to seven years. So um, we once it's uh, we spend the seventy five four thousand dollars. We after it's depreciated for the next couple of years, then it's uh, basically we own it free and clear, and there's no no addition cost. But other it's got what was, what was the original price approximately? Was it like I think it was two hundred fifty thousand. Okay. Yeah. So the next five years, <coughs> the first five years. And this is actually you know as we. This has been an intentional strategy because um, it's, quite, in most instances, it's cheaper to own an asset than it is to lease it. And uh, we, you'll see, we've already proved it a year ago, but uh, you were talking about the Pixels machine. And that Pixels machine, um, we lease the one that we have currently for 10 years, over 10 years, and we've paid for it twice now. So, trying to not do that again. Well, I would I would move to approve this capital expenditure. All right, moved by John. Second. Second, America. Uh, 
Uh, all those in favor of uh, approving the capital expenditure request, uh, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. And that will give some. All right. Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to thank you know Kelly and Jason and all that work you guys did behind the scenes to uh, deal with all these new accounting things. It, it, people just have to appreciate how much work that was to to, to get this all square away. So thanks again. You are appreciated. Thank you. And you too, Scott. I, I kind of wonder when Jason is going back and forth and taking tasks on their own verbiage. They're suddenly thinking, oh my gosh, we can actually do that. <laughs> taking us a task on this. <laughs> well done. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have the community relations report. This is on page 62 and 63. Uh, Del, are you on there? Well, I am. Are you guys able to hear me all right? Yes. Loud and clear. Perfect. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to add to the report. I did want to bring one event up to see if there's an interest from the board. The Chamber Annual Awards and Gala is Thursday, March 16th at CWU. And if there is an interest from board members to attend, I would be happy to grab a table for KBH. Um, so I wanted to throw that out there and I'd be happy to have, um, I can have Justin send this message out to you with details. And if you can just let me know over the next few days, if there's an interest, uh, we will go ahead and respond Michelle, to that. So it's a table of eight? Uh, Correct. Mike and I will be able to fill it with what happens at this event? The chamber award banquet. We have won something a couple of years ago. Sixteenth of March. Correct. Correct. In the evening. Other than that, um, we are nice and busy with all the recruiting efforts, both through onboarding and offboarding, through preparation for the different recruiting events, um, and keeping all the information updated for our patients. So I would be happy to take any questions you might have. Can you talk about radar? I can. I was wondering if you wanted me to talk about that. Can you wait a uh, graphic in that? Um, oh, probably not just because of the okay. system that I'm on. No so I, I mentioned on, in my report that we started with Raider 8 on Tuesday. Raider 8, um, to make it very simple, they solicit feedback real time from patients who are visiting our clinics. Um, once a patient's checked out, they receive a text or an email message that says, please rate your experience with Dr. So-and-so or with Family Medicine Ellensburg. Um, before we started this on Monday afternoon, our average KVH Google rating was a 2.25. Um, the number of responses we had throughout 2022 across all of Google were 69 responses with 56.5% of those, thank you, Jeff, very much, um, being one-star responses. When we went live on Monday afternoon, to date, we now have 126. So we've almost doubled the total responses we had from people in 2022. 88.1% of the responses we're getting from, from our patients are positive feedback. Um, and you'll see that line down on the bottom right that completely shifts the story to what I would consider the actual story of what the majority of our patients feel that they're receiving phenomenal care. Um, our star rating in less than two days has gone from that 2.2 to 4.7. And so we are in the mid, well, we are two days into a 30 day free trial um, and I am astounded by the results. The comments that are coming through from our patients um, are extremely flattering, glowing. Um, my plan was to give you a full report on next month's board report. Um, we, I did share this message out today with the team wanting to make sure that uh, most of this is within the clinics. And so uh, the feedback was just so great. And I know providers and staff are feeling overwhelmed. So I really just wanted to get this information out so they could hear some good news. Well, and not only are we getting the vast majority of five-star rating, but 
What did you say the percentage of folks leaving comments with? Oh, I didn't. Somebody else did that math. Okay. I did not do. Sorry. So it's like it was something like fifty-seven percent. Yeah. Oh, it, and, so not and, just clicking a storm, but taking right. time to actually yeah. say something. So Correct. Wonderful. Huh. Answer right. Correct. Uh, and they're they calling they're calling providers out by name. Um, there is one comment in here. If I can get to my, uh, I'm looking at my dashboard. That I'm going to just scroll through real quick because they specifically said, please share this with your board. Um, and like I said, I was going to do this next month. And I'm doing a quick scroll. And of course, it's not because there are so many, I'm not going to find it. Um, but this will be shared with you. you. You will see these. These are public right now during this trial um, that we're just focusing on Google. If we continue, what will happen um, is they look across the main platforms that patients use. So looking at Google, HealthGrades, Vitals, and WebMD. And they'll distribute their reviews across those. So say, for example, Family Medicine Ellensburg has a 4.8 rating on Google, and there's nothing on Vitals. Instead of posting that review on Google, they'll post it on Vitals. So there is no filtering of reviews. Every single review goes on. Um, no filtering of comments. It's just trying to solicit actual feedback um, that the public can see. And you said we're on a trial of this right now? Correct. And what, what are your plans when the trial comes to an end? Any thoughts yet? Um, well, my initial thoughts is absolutely we're going forward, but I guess we're, we're two days in. Um, we get, gave some basic scripting to our PSRs so that they can give people a heads up when they come in that they might be re receiving this message. Um, and so, you know, we want to see how our patients are reacting to it and, you know, give it a little bit more time, but it looks very promising right now. And do you think any of the negative comments that come in through this process, we can utilize to look for corrective actions or learn from it or what, uh, you, you know, I, I, I absolutely yeah. hope so. You know, what we've done in the past is when things come in, um, on Google, if it was anything we could um, act upon, we would share it, we'd take a screenshot and share it to the clinic managers. You know, we can't do anything with the basic, somebody just gives us a one or two star rating. If somebody leaves actual feedback, um, these volumes are gonna be much different than they were. So I'd like to work with Stacy and her team on what's the best cadence um, to get this information to them. You know, it used to be that we could just go in and respond to each one individually, but you saw that you know we were dealing with 69 in a year. And that was a dramatic jump actually from the year before, just because of the work that Kirsten's been doing. So we'll we'll definitely have to, yes, we want to use valuable information like this. We want to be able to um, learn from our patients. Uh, there are even some comments in here. Some patients have said, uh, you know, want more detail? I'd love for you to reach out. And they actually gave us the name. And so it's a whole new world and we're not gonna go at this by ourselves. You know, it involves quality and the leaders of these clinics. And so we'll work together to figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. I also wanna mention, Matt uh, and there's a new healthcare reporter at the Daily Record. Matt and I will be meeting with him on Sunday. Do you know that name? Sprouse. 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 Um, and then February 6th, I will be presenting to the Ellensburg City Council, just updates on KDH and talking about the plans for the construction project and the upcoming year. So. In person or on Zoom? In person. I saw that, um, I think it's the City Council is having uh, coffee with the council. Also, some garbage like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd like to get the original up and running again at some point. I don't know who's uh, on board with that. Trademark. Yeah. Yeah. But we'd, uh, but, but you know, so I know that the plan was to do it somewhere downtown or something, which is, I think, fine with us. Uh, but uh, I don't know who's, I don't know if that's your thing, Michelle, or. I think it'll be Justin and I. That was usually a yeah. um, I would like a so the last two to do this were John and Erica. Um, who would like to be the next two? 
I mean, I'll do it with Bob and I can do it. That's fine. Or you can do it with Terry. Terry. Well, we can't, all three of us do it. Okay. Uh, but we'll figure it out. But, and we're looking for an off site location. Or, I mean, I can, yeah, I mean, if, uh, you know, we can do it at Albold's or something. Okay. Or, yeah, yeah. Just on Albold's. I'm going to give it up to you. But we'll figure it out. Well, we can figure it out. Banquet with the commissioner. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions for Michelle? Thank you very much, Thank Michelle. You. No right, problem. Now, Thank you. Justin had a couple of educational opportunities he wanted to talk to us about. Uh, Justin? Yeah. So the first things first, um, June 26th and 27th, um, there are four um, unclaimed rooms um, at Campbell's for the Rural Leadership Conference. Um, so I'm just putting it forth to SLT and the board, um, who, who would ever would like to go to that. I have them booked and I can change the names. Um, so you can reach out to me later on or if four people want to volunteer right now, I can take down the names, whatever. And it sounds like they have more rooms if more than that one. Of course, yeah, they, right for now, because Campbell's fills up pretty quickly for these things, I'm sure. But right now, as of, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, they have more, we have a real uh, strong, for a lot of people the rural leadership conference so this is this is the wish of the rural conference mm -hmm. and there is no agenda so the conference starts the 25th for ceos only yeah. um and then the boy boy is invited later in the week <laughs> i have not been able to figure out what's going on in this meeting so um we booked five rooms I, I, we were afraid that campbell's was going to fill up um but there isn't an is not an agenda out there. They definitely, or excuse me, um, very deliberately separated it between CEOs the first couple of days and then senior leadership and board. And Terry, I think your governance group is meeting. Uh, yeah, uh, the, there's supposed to be a government committee meeting then too. Is that, is that going to be in June? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure about yeah. Right. Okay. So, uh, Julie, I know that there's no agenda yet, but this, uh, would you, would you think that there's, that there's some value to be had here? It's just like uh, previous. Yeah, you know. I, I would think so. And, um, uh, they're revamping. I, I know they're trying to stand up their rural safety. So I like mm -hmm. Mandy might be there. So it would be nice to have a combination. Well, I, I mean, I'd be happy to go. Yeah, do we know how soon we might submit an agenda? I don't know. Okay. So it sounds like uh, John and I and Erica. Uh, I probably go. Yes, uh, I might go too. Sounds like maybe the whole board might be interested. Uh, of course, uh, Terry, Bob, and John and I will just share one room. So <laughs> well, I'm actually I'm actually glad you brought that up because the, the rooms that are available that we're going to be booking are two queens in the room. Yeah. I I don't know how you guys feel about that. Well, in the past, we've done one room per person. Okay, that's uh, but, yeah. uh, but who knows? You know, you never I, just, know. I do know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I just wanted to put that forth because save money, I guess. Uh, and then the second thing is, and maybe this can be handled later, you guys tell me and stop me halfway through if you'd like. Uh, you guys might have noticed a lot of calendar notifications coming through about the board this week. Um, and if not, that's, that's good. Um, but what I was doing uh, to keep, you know, the most up-to-date information out there, uh, which seems to have backfired on me today, uh, is putting the new documents, the new board packet, the updated information I get in the actual calendar invite. It makes me send an invite to do that. And so if that's not the way you guys want me to do that, I can just keep it all in my own private Folders. Uh, if you'd like the updates to go onto the meeting invite, you know, with the board packet, with the agenda, with other materials that get added. Um, I personally like a separate email with the packet because when I click and accept that invite, the email disappears. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it technically I can go to the calendar and if I dig down and know to dig down, I can find it somewhere on the calendar. But the email itself, which is the most convenient place. To quickly look up and find the packet has disappeared. Okay. So it all week long, it's a very common um, for us to update the agenda or say, oh, I forgot about this. Um, what I'm hearing is send the, the invite once, and then when the packet is complete near the board date, send an email with all the latest. That'd be great. Yeah, that sounds good. And for me, the hard copy when I arrive here 
is really nice if it reflects the latest updates because I read through the digital one. Now I can sit down and be making notes, but of course, that's just my opinion. Everyone else is fine. And the updated iPads will also be able to display the package. Yeah, so with that, Jeff and John, I believe, are probably I'm gonna probably going to give my iPad back. I just don't think it's it's not improving my life at all. Um, so I, I and I'll talk to Jeff about that and, and, and whatnot, but yeah, just. The only thing I can really do it is read this board tag, and it's crazy to carry around an iPad just to read a board tag <laughs> once a month. That's course. the only way I could probably, well, once upon a time I could get it in advance on this, and then that stopped working, so I stopped using the iPad. But I still cannot download the packet with other means, so I always wait for my paper packet. You give us a PDF and email. It, 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 well, it says it's gonna, and then it just goes back. Hey, why don't you reach out? Reach out to me on that. Yeah. Yeah, I can help you with that. Okay. Um, yeah. But I, I appreciate your time. I'll make sure we get stuff like that. Yeah. I think yeah. there's a better one out there that we can actually make notes on, and there's just more to it that would be much more useful. Yeah. Well, yeah. people are interested in that, I guess we're good. Are you hearing this, Jeff? Yeah. And so what I'm doing kind of in the background um, is looking at kind of a uh, board software as well. Um, and so I know one that we've used in the past and, and I reached out and they're still using it. It's called uh, Director's Desk, but there are softwares out there that's basically now on the cloud. That, you know, you can read um, if there's any updates or changes to the packet, that's immediate. And each individual can make edits and changes or notes to their own packet um, for whatever meeting as well. And those are those are saved. So so there's other th options that um, I'm kind of in the background just taking a look at and that we can <laughs> probably look at it at, from a budget standpoint and then kind of go forward. So if I recall correctly, when I tried to make little notes with Dropbox, they were not. Uh, user specific and it, it, everybody else got my notes yeah. yeah the other piece to that is you know if since it's on the cloud you can you can use any device you want um to be able to access it and look at it as well right so okay yeah, so what kind of options there are uh anything else just all right so it sounds like uh, you'll need to get a couple of other rooms because it's got the five commissioners, Julie, and perhaps Mandy. I think. And Campbell's was the 26th and 27th. 26th and 27th, leaving on the 28th. So, okay, oh. we're on the 28th. Is that what day is it? What day is relief on the uh, uh, What month is that again? June. June 2023. When is it just for CEOs? 25th, 26th. So, we are that. So, 26, 27th is Monday, Tuesday, leaving on Wednesday the 28th. So it'll be two nights, uh, 20, so arrive on 26th, okay. leave 28th. That makes sense. All right. That's fine. Uh, all right. If you, so anyway, you, you can handle that, but if you need uh -huh. like any kind of confirmation, you can email us. Of course. Thank you. Anything else, Joseph? I'm good. All right. Thanks. Uh, nothing under old business, nothing under new business. Uh, Julie, uh, how long do we need to fix this session? Uh, Jason, how long would you like? I was going to try to do 15 minutes. Then give us 40 minutes total. Okay, so uh, let's reconvene at five after, and we will uh, plan to come back out of executive session at 745. Okay. Uh, thank you all for uh, for all your uh, words and your words. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you. Good night, everyone. And Justin, you'll log me into that other session.